The tech industry continues to grab headlines as it undergoes its biggest round of layoffs since the dot-com bubble. But what does this spell out for what's ahead for tech employers and employees this time around? Here to discuss is Ahmed Banafa, San Jose State University professor, along with Betsy Stevenson, University of Michigan professor and former member of the Council of Economic Advisors. A big welcome to you both. So, Ahmed, I want to start with you because I know that during the dot-com bubble, that was something that you were a part of. You were part of those layoffs. So in terms of the worst of it, Historically, do you think the worst of it is behind us in terms of the layoffs? Well, I mean, uh, nobody knows that. I mean, I hope that I have that crystal ball to, to say that. But what we have seen so far, actually, a big numbers that we see them from the big companies, uh, tech companies just announcing them. And they're saying that, OK, after that, we're going to be fine, even uh, for a case of Google. The CEO, he said that this is going to help us going forward. Nobody say that we are, you know, we're done with it. That that what they're saying, this is going to take us through what we expect in 2023. And Betsy, I want to ask you um, in terms of what we're seeing, obviously the dot-com bubble, a lot of different factors at play here than we saw, than we saw then. Talk about some of those factors and what that might spell in terms of perhaps what tech employees might see in this sort of environment. Well, I, I think there's a lot of things that are different from the the dot com bubble. Well, let's focus on what what we've seen in the tech industry so far uh, in the last few years and why they're they're pulling back a little bit right now. You know, the tech industry for the tech industry, the pandemic was actually a windfall. Every other industry out there struggled and had a really difficult period in 2020 and 2021. But for tech, this was a period of just massive expansion. You know, all these people who hadn't wanted to shop online all of a sudden were forced to shop online and Amazon saw a surge of customers. People who hadn't wanted to use social media found it was the only way to stay in touch with people. So they pulled a lot of new subscribers, new customers, new users forward. People who might have been pushed into adopting in 2023 or 2024 or 2025 all of a sudden felt they had to do it at the start of the pandemic. And I think the magical thinking that can exist in the tech sector and was part of what happened to the dot-com crisis, but that magical thinking made them think, no, it's not that we're pulling customers forward, it's that we've created all these new customers and that growth is going to continue as you know, far as the eye can see. And they hired for magical thinking. So what they're having to do right now is readjust for reality. Uh, as you've already shown, the layoffs we're seeing here are small compared to not just the hiring they did during 2020 and 2021, but the sort of over hiring that they did relative to where they had been when the pandemic started. So I think we're seeing a readjustment here and this readjustment makes sense. And it's gonna be helpful to industries that have found it actually hard to hire in this environment, hard to fully recover and have been looking forward to being able to hire people. So we've just got a little bit of a, re a sectoral readjustment that could be super painful for the people who lost their jobs. Um, but we're, you know, that is part of our healing from the pandemic. You know, Ahmed, I, I want to ask about uh, the kind of 800 pound gorilla of the tech industry, Apple. I talked about it earlier about how they were slow as far as their hiring goes. But now we're going into uh, their earnings report next week. We're expecting to see slower iPhone sales. We're expecting to see slower Mac sales. We're expecting some potential uh, problems with services as far as foreign exchange headwinds go. So, you know, at what point does something happen to Apple, if anything? And then what does that do to the broader tech industry? They're a bellwether, right? And if they've been unaffected so far, that's good. But if they start to run into trouble, what does that mean then for the rest of the industry? Well, that's a very good point. You know, um, I have a lot of my uh, students, my friends work at Apple. And, uh, you know, uh, during the time when this big rush of hiring people, Apple was really slowing down. I mean, the revenue went up by 52 percent. Their hiring went up by 19 percent compared to the other tech companies who really matched their revenue with the rate of hiring. So for, for looking at, at Apple, and it's a purely consume, uh, consumer-based uh, company, which means you and I and other, if you don't buy the iPhone, other product is going to impact them directly. They are really related to what we see, what we hear about the inflation, about the possibilities of recession. And uh, they're trying to diverse the sources of their manufacturing by going to India and have something like 25% of their production there and Vietnam to avoid any political uh, geopolitical problems in the future. 
but if the consumer starts slowing down and there was a report you know from the fourth quarter that the customers are pulling back on their and their sending and their spending uh, that could impact uh, uh, you know apple and and uh, if apple starts slowing down and start laying off people uh, we might go to uh, some like a mini version of what happened with the dot com or the 2008 because it's it's actually a leader in this field and Betsy, I know we talk a lot about the, the tech layoffs, but obviously when we look at some of the, the broader economy, how do the sort of the layoffs that we're seeing there compare to what we can expect if we can expect those sort of repercussions in the broader economy, especially when you have some of these high skilled workers on H1B visas having this maximum 60 day grace period to try and get another job as well? Yeah, so I, I'm just going to disagree a little bit here because, um, you know, when we look at consumer spending, it is it been surprisingly robust. We know it needs to slow down. It was too fast, it, uh, and that was part of what built up the inflationary pressure. But it hasn't actually declined. That's what's keeping us out of a recession. It's continuing to grow. But what happened was consumers gorged themselves on goods. We saw spending on goods that we'd never seen before. And there's only so much stuff people can have. If everybody already has a new iPhone, of course they're going to slow down in buying iPhones. But do you know what they haven't been doing? Getting their hair cut as regularly, going out to dinner as regularly, traveling as regularly. So there's a whole bunch of sectors that would like to see some of the consumer dollars flow back to them. We are absolutely going to see a contraction in the goods producing sector. We're going to see contraction in tech, which is mostly services. But I think we're going to see continue to see expansions in other parts of the economy. And so the question is whether those expansions will be big enough to offset the losses in the tech sector. But the tech sector is not the overall economy. In fact, if we look at where our most of our job growth and our GDP growth was coming from prior to the pandemic, it's expansion and basic things people need like health services, education services, and then things people enjoy like leisure and hospitality services. So all of that stuff is still expanding and I think will continue to expand enough to make up for some of the, the losses in the tech sector. And as you point out, yeah, you know, uh, our own friend of the show, Sam Rowe, had said uh, how the tech economy basically makes up about 2% of total employment, 2.8%. Uh, on that, I, I just want to ask you really quick about the, the subscription services that we had seen really blow up during the pandemic. Obviously, Netflix had seen serious share price declines uh, as we rolled through 2022. Um, I guess when people signed up for all of these things, they started to pull back a little bit. Uh, post pandemic or I guess towards the tail end of 2022. Are we going to, con to continue to see that kind of pullback in 2023? Do we see them go back into subscription services, whether that's, you know, Netflix, uh, Hulu, Spotify, things along those lines? Or is this kind of going to just flatten out and then we'll just see a return to normal growth that we had seen before? Well, it's, it's part of the general movement here. And this is a very good point about the subscription services, because uh, subscription services is is one of the uh, one of the best you know revenue sources for any of, of the companies in the tech industry. Now, for companies like Netflix and the others, it depends on many factors. For one of them is what kind of uh, shows they are offering, and at the same time, uh, my you know my vision or my projection is that we we're going back to uh, you know some kind of fragmentation in the subscription uh, services for la streaming for the streaming uh, you know services and for for the entertainment. Uh, we this is this is away from the cable which has brought everything together. I see that there will be some kind of bringing those services together, and you have seen some kind of a merger between some of those streaming services. Why? Because they want to combine their bases and offer more shows. And this is going to be the same thing for the subscription. The more you look at it, the more it's going to be more selective for the consumers. They would like to get more for their money. And now people are leaving their houses. They go into the theaters. They have other things to do instead of just sitting home, like what happened in the pandemic. And the only option they have is to watch, you know, one of those streaming services. A big thank you to our panel there, Ahmad Banafa, San Jose State University professor, and Betsy Stevenson, University of Michigan professor and former member of the Council of Economic Advisors. Thank you for breaking down the nuances here.